Hi there, my name is Peter Eastway. Canson has invited me to give a little presentation on my photography and I've chosen some photos from a recent voyage down to Antarctica and I've called it Late Season. So why have I called it Late Season? Antarctica is normally visited between October and March. So March was when I was down there, so it's late in the season. It's late in the travel season. And effectively, it's the end of summer, beginning of autumn, definitely not into winter. Um, one of the advantages of going late season is that you do have proper sunrises and sunsets. When you go earlier in the year, certainly closer to December, uh, it's usual that you have no sunrise and no sunset and the sun just sits up in the top of the sky going round and round. So as a landscape photographer, there are certainly advantages in going late season. The other advantages that I discovered, I think, was just the way the landscape looks so different. Now, mindful that I'm from Australia where we have next to no snow, we have a couple of little mountains or hills, I think people call them, and sometimes they're covered in snow and sometimes, or usually they're not. So I love going to snowy locations because they're so new and different to me. And what I liked about Antarctica in the late season was that it was, it was like visiting the Alps in Europe um, in late, uh, well, sorry, yeah, spring, late, late spring, where there's just a little bit of snow around, but you can see the shapes of the mountains and the rocks, and the colours of the rocks underneath. And that's what I found this time down in Antarctica, that it was quite a different look. Um, I love Antarctica when it's full of snow, covered in white, and we certainly had those opportunities as well. But there were many locations that I think looked distinctly different because it was so late in the season. And as a landscape photographer, that was great. Now, if you're going to Antarctica to see the wildlife, then maybe late season isn't optimum. If you want to see whales, it's great. If you want to see lots of penguins, well, you might get to see a, a couple of rookeries where there's one or 2,000 penguins and you could think that that's a lot of penguins. But if you go in the middle of the season when all of the chicks are around, you can go to places where there are 200, 300, 400,000 penguins all in one location and that is quite impressive in itself. So it's difficult to say what is the best time to travel to Antarctica. There are differences and in many ways it doesn't matter which time you go because whatever you see is just going to be amazing. Some of the shots you're seeing up on the screen just at the moment are of Deception Island and the first time I was there in March there hadn't been snow for quite a while and there's a lot of melt and you're just seeing the, the remnants of the snow and that was great. On the second voyage though it was completely different because it had snowed quite a lot recently and so a lot of what you're seeing just now that was certainly not available. So I guess in summary any time to go to Antarctica is a great time and I guess we could say the same thing about the Arctic. There are certain similarities, but I always offer photographers who come along with me uh, $1,000 for anyone who finds a penguin up in the Arctic and a polar bear down in the Antarctic. So when you do these locations, it's normally with a ship. Some intrepid souls will go down on a small yacht and uh, perhaps do a little bit more walking than we do, but I think a ship is nice. I, smaller ships with a smaller cr um, passenger list is, are better. Most of the um, expedition ships down to Antarctica have a maximum of 100 passengers or maybe 100 passengers and 10 to 20 kayakers. The reason being that um, the, lo the locations that we visit, you can't have more than 100 passengers ashore at any one time. And so if you go in a ship which has got you know, 100, oh, sorry, 200, 500, 1,000 passengers, then sometimes you'll be moored off the location and maybe it's a shuttle service while you get a, a little bit of time ashore. And, that's great, and certainly those voyages are probably less expensive, but if I, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't recommend more an expedition ship where it is only 100 or even 50 passengers who are on board, and that means everybody can get off and it maximizes the time for sure. So when you're on the ship, there are different opportunities depending where you're shooting from. The ship itself is a great platform, normally very stable, but there, there are times when you're going across the seas where it can be rocky, and you know, so certainly seasickness is an issue. But most of the time when you're in Antarctica or in South Georgia, you're in quiet areas and um, the, the water is smooth and you don't have any problems at all. But you do have lots of opportunities to shoot from the deck of the ship, and a lot of the photos you see here were taken from the deck. Other shots are taken from the Zodiac, the little inflatable sh um, uh, 
Lord Fred and Dingies, and they will all jump on them and we go for what we call Zodiac Cruises. And they allow you to get close to the wildlife, close to the icebergs, and you may or may not land. And that's the third type of um, excursion, and that's the landings where you actually get to put your feet on terra firma, and it's certainly wonderful uh, experiencing these locations firsthand. So, for many, the, a trip to an, an, for many, a trip to Antarctica is the trip of a lifetime. I've managed to do six or seven, and it's still the trips of a lifetime. It's an amazing place to go. So, when you're going there, what am I shooting with? Most of the wildlife photos are certainly when there's action. Now, action in Antarctica, in terms of wildlife, is a little bit different to, say, Africa, where you might have lions and cheetahs going at a thousand miles an hour. Most of the wildlife in Antarctica isn't that fast moving most of the time. I mean, penguins, when they're coming out of the water and porpoising along, they can be quite quick, but often they're just hanging around. Uh, the seals and the uh, leopard seals and the elephant um, seals, all of those guys, they're often just plodding around and not moving much at all. So you can shoot medium format down in Antarctica with the wildlife, but normally I don't have quite as long a telephoto as I'd like, and so a DSLR or a mirrorless camera is much better. I use the Fuji X-T3 and I have a 200mm f2 lens and that f2 lens is fantastic because it, well, it's very similar to a 300 2.8 um, on a full frame uh, camera but the f2 aperture just means that when you shoot at f2 you have very shallow depth of field which means that if you're photographing you know, a seal or something like that that you would have just seen before you can focus just on the whiskers or just on the eyes and everything else has this beautiful softness and that's what I like. When it comes to landscapes though, it's a little bit different. Um, sometimes I use differential focus in the landscapes and we're gonna talk a little bit about the approach and what I'm trying to achieve with my, my photos. But when it comes to the landscape, it's normally all about the detail. For landscape shooting, I'm using medium format. I actually use phase one equipment and I have a 150 megapixel back. And as you'll understand when I talk about my, my aim, my, my printing aim, Having lots and lots of pixels isn't essential, but it's certainly a lot of fun if you've got them. And so if you're wanting to make a big print, you're going to get out some roll paper, some Canson roll paper, of course, and make a you know, one by a two meter print. Then all of those extra pixels can really help make a photograph that really, really sings. And I, I perhaps may, maybe now is a good time to talk a little bit about that. So when it comes, when, when, what, what am I looking for as when I create a photograph? What is it that makes me happy? What is my end point? And I suppose that when I go up and I look at a photograph on the wall, it, you know, often it looks great from a distance. You're looking at it and you go, wow, what's that? And as you get closer and closer, you get to see more and more detail. And as you see more and more detail, it's important that that detail is still as sharp and as clear as it looked at from on the other side of the room. What we used to have in the old days of film or when you have smaller resolution digital cameras is that as you got in closer to the photograph, um, that quality was lost. I mean, there's an old joke, isn't there, that how do you know there's a photographer at your exhibition? That's the only person who's up there, you know, a couple of, you know, 15 centimetres away from the photograph looking at all the detail. But that's what we're like. Photographers do like the detail. I mean, yes, on the one hand, I suppose I'm a, an artist, if you want to call me that. It's a grandiose word, but, you know, there's the art side of photography. But there's also the technique, the craft. And what really makes me happy, I guess, is to see that beautiful detail rendered in a print. And so the closer I get, the it, it, I just don't want to lose that. And so that's why I'm using lots and lots of pixels, because if I can print out 180 pixels per inch or higher, then as I get in closer to the print, I know I've got all of that luscious, wonderful detail for my viewers to enjoy. So when we're talking about printing, really it all starts with the capture. So is it possible to make a great print with a poor quality capture? Sometimes, but why make life hard for yourself? It's certainly much better to start with the best quality capture that you can and then go from there. So when I'm starting out in the field, if I'm wanting to make a big landscape photograph, that's why I go to the extra time and effort of using medium format. It's a big camera, it's heavy, it's annoying to carry around. Um, I get a sore back, uh, you know, I hold it up, it's heavy. I said that already, I know, but it's heavy. <laughs> but the point I guess I'm making is that all of that falls away when I open up the files 
and I look at them in my raw processor and you just bring up that detail. And that really makes me very, very happy. So image quality really starts with the capture. And yes, post-production is an integral part of that, preparing the file for printing, the printing process itself, the paper that you choose, the mounting, the framing, all of that, it's all important. In fact, every link in the chain is important. And if you break one of those links, the chain falls apart. So that's why starting with the best quality capture is a good way to make a good print. This is one of my favorite photographs from the last two voyages down to Antarctica. And I know I'm sounding a little bit uh, smart, aren't I, saying my last two voyages, but I think that what it does is it just epitomizes, for me, the Antarctic experience. Now, I've done five or six voyages down there, and very rarely do you get beautiful, bright, sunny days. I mean, I did uh, have a couple on this occasion, and they were wonderful, but normally it's very moody. And I then need to, to, I need to overlay something else for you. And a lot of people look at photographs and think, oh, wasn't that great? But a lot of photographs start with an idea, and that, that idea might necessarily be, oh, I'm going to go down to Antarctica and find a little island and take a photograph. It doesn't quite work like that. It works a little differently. Well, in this case, let's as an example. So over the years, I've done a lot of reading about Antarctica, including a lot of the historical books and you know, how people first discovered it. I mean, we can talk about Frank Hurley as one of the photographers, but before then, 100 years before then, when people were doing little pen and etching, uh, you know, pen and well, pen etchings to put in old newspapers, the old gravure process, I guess it was. And they would have these wonderful little islands covered in snow that would go right down to the water's edge. And that was what really, I guess, piqued my interest. It, uh, I, I found that it was quite a romantic feeling, you might say, where there's just these little, little islands just everywhere, or little headlands, and they're all covered in snow, and the snow goes all the way down to the water's edge. Now, remembering I come from Australia, and it's just, you know, if we have snow here, it's, you know, for a couple of hours, you know, it might be for a couple of months and just in a small area. We don't have mountains, we've got a few hills and that's about it. So when I go overseas, I love the fact that there can be snow and I, I love the, 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 the snowy uh, environment. And so for me, this was quite different. And I used to think of snow, then lots of green grass or red earth and then the, and the ocean. But to have the snow go straight to the water's edge was something quite different. And so every time I go down to Antarctica, I find that I'm actually drawn towards these little islands which are covered in snow. Now, this island doesn't have snow all the way around it, and maybe that's a downside, maybe it's an advantage. I've got other islands from the trip where they're, they're perfectly covered in snow and they're great. But what you find when the clouds come in is very often the top of the little island is covered by the cloud. But we were watching this island for maybe half an hour, 45 minutes as the ship sailed past slowly. I was shooting it with a long telephoto and then a wider angle as we came closer and then a telephoto again. And as we went, as we came quite close in this particular occasion, although it shot with a 240mm lens, so like a 150mm telephoto on a full frame DSLR. And so I, the, the clouds just parted. And I've got 40, 50 shots taken over that half hour period, just different ways that the cloud was just swirling around and this just brought it all together. So I've got that idea, I've got the idea of the little islands, I've got the idea of the clouds, um, and so when you're there on location and these opportunities arise, you sort of go into automatic and it's all a matter about collecting the pixels about using your camera to capture the best shot so that later on you can go through the development process and out to print. Photography for me is always a two-step process, capture and post-production. Capture is all about getting those pixels and there's certainly creativity in the use of light, composition, the choice of camera technique. And post-production is also about just moving the pixels around plus the creativity that post-production tools allow you to do where you can really interpret the image. And then of course from there you need to have the good quality image so that it goes to print at the end of the day. So what I'd like to just talk about a little bit before we get on to the, you know, the perhaps the more emotive and interesting side of the post-production is just to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to capturing those pixels. Today's modern cameras capture so much detail that you can be forgiven for thinking that all you've got to do is turn on autofocus and everything will be okay. What I've discovered with shooting medium format, and I discovered this 
even when we're only shooting with 37 megapixel sensors. And I mean, so many DSLRs have got, you know, 46, 50, 64 megapixels these days. So, you know, 37 isn't that lot, it isn't that much. But what I discovered is that when you're focusing on infinity, the area in front of infinity is often not quite as sharp as you think it is. So that we talked before about how I like to see a big print and as I get closer and closer, I don't want to be disappointed. And what I found was that that big print looked great, but as I got closer, I found that that focus wasn't really quite as sharp as I thought. And maybe I'm not focusing on the distant mountain range. Maybe I'm focusing on a headland a little bit closer. And, what I, and that might be beautifully sharp in that big print, but then I would find that that background mountain, which is further away again, wasn't quite sharp. And that was a problem because I want my pictures to be sharp from front to end. Not always, I, I'm into differential focus. But for my landscapes, if that's what I'm aiming, if, if I want that to be sharp, if I want the image area to be sharp, it's got to be tack sharp. So my belief and my understanding is that depth of field is okay, but it has a lot of limitations. So if we're using a super wide angle lens, even with medium format, I have my, uh, my Alpa with the 150 megapixel, I've got a 23 mil um, Alpagon lens on it, and you know, that's, that's you know, 17 mil, 14 mil, something like that. it's very wide. And yes, if I focus on infinity, I'll have a lot of my subject in sharp focus. So I could focus on say 50 meters away or 30 meters away, and I would still have infinity sharp. In other words, that background mountain range really takes sharp. But if I did that with a 55mm or a 110 and certainly with a 240mm on the, um, on the XF, the Schneider lenses, which are longer focal lengths, longer focal lengths, then that focusing difference becomes important and I, I, can't, I can't rely on depth of field. I feel that there really is only one plane of sharp focus and I know that with telephoto lenses, focus gets shallower and shallower, but we, that's, um, it's not just the focal length that affects depth of field. In addition to the aperture, there's the, um, we've got the, how close the subject is, so the closer your subject, the shallower the depth of field. Um, but there's also the format, so that you look at the smartphones that people have, and you take a photograph and there's someone standing three, meters, uh, three feet away, one metre away, and the infinity is, you know, the mountain range in the background is tack sharp. And that's because small sensors have inherently great depth of field. They've got lots of depth of field. Everything is sharp perfect for an iPhone or a, a Samsung or whatever they are. That works. When it comes to larger formats, depth of field is inherently shallower. And it's not really that anything's changing. Depth of field isn't actually something magic. Depth of field is just our inability to see that it's not sharp. And the bigger the sensor, the easier it is to see that something is not sharp. And so depth of field becomes shallow. In other words, we're not happy with an area of an image as being sharp because it's just not quite sharp enough and we can see that. The same thing happens when you make a bigger print. So when you make a small image, and you might put it on, you know, a, a, you know, the images you're looking at on your computer or your iPad or whatever it is at the moment, when they're that small, you can't tell whether uh, that depth of field is working or not. Everything looks pretty good. As soon as you make a big print, all of that becomes much more visible. It's much clearer that depth of field has got its limitations. So understanding that, what all photographers should do with their new cameras is just check that their lenses are actually focusing properly. Now, if you're focusing manually, 100% um, live view, that's a good way. You, you know that you've got a sharp shot. But often the lenses are slightly out of kilter and that's why a lot of cameras have a focus trim or a focus calibration technique or a feature within the camera because the manufacturers know that there can be little differences in manufacturing. Those tolerances are tight, but they can move just a little bit. And so if you can re-trim your lens so that it's focusing really, really precisely, that's the first step. That means that what you focus on is going to be as sharp as it can be. And then you might need to revisit depth of field because the bigger the print, the less you might be happy with how sharp it is. So what is the solution? The solution is to perhaps focus stack. Now focus stacking is not going to work if you're on a ship and you're moving because yeah, it relies on you and your subject being still. It's hard to use when it's grass is blowing in the wind because the subject isn't still. But there are a lot of times when you can focus stack. And so because I'm collecting pixels, focus stacking is just a technique that I use to collect pixels so that when I get back after the trip or wherever I've done the shoot, 
I have all the pixels I need to make that perfect shot. So let's say that I have an image, I focus stacked it, I've got maybe five, 15 shots, and I'm back processing the images. I might just pick one of the middle shots, the middle focus, and process it out small, put it on Instagram, because down small, there'll be enough depth of field to make that image look sharp, and I don't need to do anything more. But then if I decide to make a bigger version of that for a book or for a print, then suddenly I need to work it properly and I'll spend the time to focus stack the images, to, to process them in Serene or uh, Helicon Focus and produce that, that final image where the image, where all the detail is there from foreground to background. I hope that sort of makes sense. While I'm collecting pixels in terms of focusing, I'm also exposure bracketing. Now, with medium format, I don't necessarily need to exposure bracket quite as often as some of the smaller cameras because medium format has a fantastic dynamic range. Dynamic range meaning the ability to capture a wide range of tones. If we're photographing on a dull overcast day, all cameras can capture the range of tones because it's not a very wide range of tones. But bright sunny days where there are deep shadows, then there is a, a wide range of tones and some cameras can capture more of those tones than others. But even if you've got the best camera in the world, there are situations where there is more range of tones than the camera can capture. So you need to take, you need to expose your bracket to capture there. Make sure you've got detail in the highlights, details in the shadow, might as well do one in the middle, and then you can join them together again in post-production. Again, this is not meant to be a lesson on these techniques, just uh, a point of that. When it comes to creating that beautiful print at the end of the day, the capture technique that you use really does have an impact on the final print. The last thing I want to say is that I'll often shoot a little bit wider. So I get to a scene, I frame it up, I take the shot, I get back and I look at it and I go, ah, I really feel like I needed a little bit more space in that. Why didn't I shoot it a bit wider? So this is just the voice of experience. These days what I'll do is might put on a wider lens, just take another shot. I don't have zooms. If you've got a zoom, you can just zoom out. Or we can use this wonderful modern invention. We can use our feet and I can step back five feet, 10 feet, assuming I'm not gonna walk off the other side of the boat or something like that, and, and take another shot. I just feel that if I frame a bit wider, it means that I can change my mind later on in post-production. And I do find that when I'm out in the field, the excitement of getting the shot, sometimes I might be thinking as clearly as I should be, and so that wider frame is a form of insurance. So when I'm on location and I'm taking a photograph, do I have in mind exactly what I want to do at the other end in terms of post-production? And the answer is yes, no, and sometimes. There isn't a single way that I work, and I guess one of the advantages of having a few years of experience is that I've worked out what I like in terms of photography so that I do have, I, I, I do see patterns in the way that I shoot. I, I definitely do like to have a slightly darker sky. I like a bit of a vignette. There, I quite like to use colour, you know, I like to think in an educated way. Um, I, so I have ideas so that when I'm standing on the ship or um, in, in the landscape and I'm taking a photograph, if I'm shooting a portrait, it doesn't really much matter. For me, photography is always a two-step process. It always has been a two-step process. I think it always will be. Yes, camera manufacturers and certainly the phone manufacturers, they give you the idea, just press the button, you've got a photo, and that's as far as you can go. That's as far as you have to go just to have a record. But if you want to interpret the image, Post-production is really a godsend. It's, it really has given photographers the ability to do more or less anything that they want to. Now, there are a lot of arguments about some people taking it too far or whatever. Hey, it's a free world. Uh, photography is a language. Just like English is a language, I can use English to write a receipt, do a scientific um, journal or write some poetry. Um, and photography is the same. It can be used for documentary, it can be used for art, it can be used for something in between. So. When it come, but, but either way, even if you're doing documentary, what comes out of the camera is not necessarily optimum in terms of communicating what you saw and what you want your, vis what you want your viewers to receive. And so the ability to adjust exposure, contrast, colour saturation and a host of other things, just to strengthen the message, to make it clearer what it is that you want your subjects to look at, that to me is the mark of a successful photographer and a successful photograph. Mm. Can you make other people happy with what you do in photography? Probably not. Sometimes, but not always. So the only person you can really make happy is yourself. So that should be your number one aim. Um, so looking at the images, I guess um, 
here when I was standing on the, the game, this is a shot a little bit earlier than the, uh, the island shot that I had there before. And, you know, what isn't there to like about this? But if, uh, you know, that, that cloud coming off the mountain, the wind whipping it up, it really had a, Antarctic, an Antarctic wintry feeling about it. So if we look at though, if I just come over here, and I'm, I'm working in Capture One. I work in both Capture One and Lightroom. Uh, Capture One I use for the Phase One files definitely, and uh, I often use it for uh, my other cameras as well. But Lightroom, of course, I, you know, is a wonderful tool, the ability to, uh, uh, to play with, uh, you know, to put your photos up onto the, the cloud and all sorts of cool stuff in uh, Lightroom. So I'm, 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 I play both ways. But here you can see this, the image as I've started. That's um, been processed a little bit. And we come down here and look at the uh, exposure, just opening up the uh, other adjustments down here. You see on the bottom right. So you can see really all I've done, I'll just check before I'm not telling you any lies, nothing much happened. All I've really done is just adjust the exposure because I know that's where I'm wanting to head because I want to get the drama. I mean, what I'm, when I was looking across at this scene as we're going past, it was full of drama, these, these, these clouds coming off. So now that you know what I saw and what I felt, when I adjust the image, so now I'm just using selective adjustment layers to lighten the image up, darken the top of the sky, darken the water down below. Why am I darkening those? Because the middle of the picture is what's important to me. So I don't want the eye to be distracted by light areas around the edges. So it's a sort of vignetting in another way. So then darkening down the sky a little bit more, and you can see by darkening that sky down a bit more, it really makes the mountain stand out. But I need to get those clouds a bit more. Well, I'll darken down the sky a bit more, but there we go. Lightening up those clouds. And you know, so now, you know, just, just that bit of an adjustment, it sort of makes the image that much stronger, that much more engaging. Lighten up the foreground, because it just looked a little bit dull in there. So again, just matching the exposure and then you know, finishing the image off. So you know, people say, well, how do you know what you want to do? And I come back to the idea of an idea. So photography is all about our ideas. If you know what you like, if you, you, know, if you have a, an, an approach, an attitude, an understanding of what it is that you want to show people, it becomes very simple. I'm looking at the photograph as it started off and I'm just saying, all right, without these adjustment layers, if I turn them all off, it looks a little bit flat. It doesn't have the drama. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I love the subject. Framing's good, all of that. I like the clouds in the background, it all works. But it doesn't have what I felt. It doesn't have the emotion. And so this is where post-production comes into it. And you know, if I'm going to make a print, then I don't want to make a print of something that's lacklustre. You know, when it goes up on the wall, if I spend all that time and energy and I put it up on the wall, then that print has to sing. It's got to look great. And that's why post-production is such an important part of, this, of the process from capture to print. Let's look at an example from woe to go, from processing the raw file out to the finished result in Photoshop. Now, every image is a little bit different. So this is just an example, and it's not necessarily typical, but it's not untypical either. Um, I try to limit how much post-production I do these days. I don't want to spend all my time sitting in a chair looking at a square box, but by the same token, if it makes me happy to end up with a strong picture, I'll spend whatever time is required. So let's just have a quick look at Capture One. So this is the original image. You can see these are some of the other captures that they're shot with a, uh, a Canon and a 400mm lens. Um, and I've changed the colour balance and squished it and framed it as a square. Now, what I noticed when I was there on the ship was the wind and the I guess the texture in the air, because there's all this wind blown snow, um, it's mixed in with the cloud and it's this really moving feast out there. How was I going to basically express that, I guess, in the photograph? Because as you look at this, that background, that sky is relatively flat. You can see the hint of what I'm talking about in there, but the casual viewer, if I hadn't mentioned it to you, you might have just moved on to the next photograph. It looks a bit flat. How do I get it from there and perhaps move it into something here which is far more dramatic, far more engaging? There's even the hint of the background ranges in the background there, which is something that you discover after you've looked at the picture for a little while. So from here, I've got a little bit of work to do. So in Capture One, it could be Lightroom Capture One, it doesn't make much difference. I've come in and I've added in an adjustment layer to lighten up 
the foreground. So I put my mask on, you can see the area. The mask is just rough and ready, doesn't always need to be precise. If you um, have ever worked in a dark room, it's very much like dodging and burning my approach. But you can see that I've lightened up and I've given that headland a little bit more presence. The next layer, when I turn that on and now off, on, and I'll show you the mask. So I'm adding, I'm, I'm using clarity basically. This is the clarity slider down here at 100%. And I'm just trying to bring out the shape in those clouds and clarity works quite well. I then come up to my third layer where I've just darkened down the water down the bottom, just using you know, just, just a uh, exposure adjustment, but I'm still struggling with that sky. So then I come up again and I add a bit more clarity and layer five, again, more clarity again. So I've got three layers creating lots of clarity. Interestingly though, the layers are not over the whole image. I haven't added so much clarity down here to the, uh, the headland. It's really just in the cloud area that I'm trying to work at. Now, these days, Lightroom and Capture One will probably allow me to go almost all the way to the finished result. I could more or less print from Capture One from Lightroom. Do I? No, not yet. I guess I'm still wedded to the idea of taking my files into Photoshop to finish them off. And certainly there are some techniques that you can use in Photoshop, you know, such as doing composites, where you can't do that in a raw processor, certainly not without some plugins, etc. So I feel that Photoshop is still the the ultimate, it's still the final resting place for my raw files before they see a print. And so looking at this, um, one, of the, one of the challenges that I have with raw processing is that normally if I apply too much of the clarity, then that has a detrimental effect on doing the work later on in Photoshop. And that's why I was careful just to apply the clarity to the sky and so that there aren't, any, aren't going to be any problems with artifacting, etc. around the headland. I will actually sharpen that up separately later on, as you'll see in Photoshop. So let's switch over to Photoshop. And here's the image, and I'll just come down and we'll turn off all of the layers. And so there's my starting point. Um, I've added a layer in and I've done a little bit of remedial work. You'll see there's a little bird flying down the bottom there. I've taken the bird out a little bit too small, and I've just done a little bit of you know, fixing up of the image, Noth nothing to worry about. So. Again, I'm assuming here that you have a, a basic familiarity with uh, layers and Photoshop, and it's not a lesson in layers, but uh, a lesson in how I approach an image. So I've added in a curves adjustment layer, and I've just darkened down the image. Why didn't I darken it down before? Often when I'm processing files out from the raw processor, I leave them in a, in a, in a middling state, not too much contrast, not too light, not too dark, and then I can do whatever I need to in Photoshop later on. So if I'm going to finish it off in the raw processor, then obviously I could do all of this. That was my first excuse. My second excuse is that I see my, my work here as a process of investigation. It's a discovery process. I don't necessarily know exactly what it's going to look like at the end, so I'm just working it out. So I've darkened it down, and what I like as I've darkened the image down is that I, I, I much prefer the way the sky is starting to look. Now, it goes without saying, of course, that all of this requires that you have a good quality, correctly calibrated monitor. Otherwise, you're not going to see the results at all. Well, you're going to see some results, but they might not be accurate. And they're certainly not going to look like the print you make at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that that's looking a little bit stronger. I'm now just not quite too sure that the headland has got everything that I want. So I'm just going to add in a little bit more uh, contrast to that. And you can see from my curve, I've just brought the white point in, the black point in, and that just increases the contrast. But I'm using a mask so that just the headland is being uh, affected. So that, that's correct because I'm happy with the sky at this stage. I won't stay completely happy with the sky, but that's okay. It, it's looking all right. And I'm just noticing along the top of the headland, there are some areas which are a little bit light. Now, when it comes to printing, one of the things that I don't like to do is to leave a lot of white paper without ink. Paper white, I guess, I guess it comes from the darkroom days. It's sort of like you haven't got enough control over your craft. Having said that, there are definitely times when paper white is wonderful to use. And there will be a few little skerricks, perhaps, of paper white in my final image, certainly down amongst the, uh, the, the, the uh, ice 
blocks down the bottom. But generally speaking, I don't like there to be paper white, and so I'll put a little bit of tone into it. And so when you see the next adjustment layer that I'm adding in, you'll just see a slight darkening along this light edge. And what I'm doing is I'm doing that as a print control to make sure that when I make my print at the end of the day, that there's going to be tone there. I will possibly do a few other adjustments later on. So if I have white in my print at this stage, that's too soon. I, if I'm going to introduce a little bit of paper white, it will be done very judiciously right at the very end. But generally speaking, paper white's a no-no for me. And then continuing on with that, I've then just lightened up a little bit of the foreground there as well, the headland. You can see I'm adding in quite a lot more contrast. You can see from the curve, it's another contrasty curve. The uh, mask, similar, but it's not touching the edge of the headland there. And I'm really ramping it up because I want that headland to be important and um, with, without these adjustment layers, if I turn them off, you see, yeah, it's interesting, but it, they, they just, it just doesn't work as strongly. Whereas now I'm making a statement about that headland as having some real structure. You know, it's, it's icy, it's hard, it's strong, and that's what the winds are swirling around. At least that's what I like to make out. So, another adjustment I'm making, um, just a little bit now. Yeah, it's hardly worth doing. But one of the things about entering photo competitions is that you often think, what would a judge say? You know, and judges are normally looking for little things that could be improved because often the big thing, the big thing, the photograph is pretty good. So how do they improve it? And so I was a little bit worried about this little area of light down here. I just thought it might catch the judge's eye. So I've just darkened it down. So when we go back to the final image and I'll turn that off and on, you know, you'd hardly notice it. And you'd think, oh, should I really be listening to Peter talking about this sort of stuff? Is he that pernickety, that um, technically orientated or uh, you know, detail orientated, sometimes, sometimes I am. So just, just live with it, I'll be okay. The water down the bottom here is also perhaps a little bit dark, so I've just lightened that up. So again, I just wanted, I didn't want there to be a darker area of water, whereas you know, people would ask, why is that darker than that? Maybe they wouldn't, I did, so I lightened it up. I'm the photographer, I get to do what I like anyway. So we're getting there. I then um, still want to get a little bit more in there, and so I've used a, another adjustment there just to add in a little bit more technique, uh, a little bit more texture. You can't quite see it that size, so let's enlarge it up. And you'll see here what, what I've used is um, a, uh, there we use a high pass filter, and it's been blended on, let me tell you, soft light, 100% uh, opacity, and it basically went when you apply the, the filter. Let's open it up and just do it quickly. It allows you to adjust the radius, and I can't remember exactly what the radius was here. Um, and I've adjusted the radius to bring out the texture in the snow there. So when I turn that off and turn it on, it's a little bit like Clarity. It's doing a similar job to Clarity in Lightroom and Capture One, uh, but they all have their own special sources and secret recipes. This is just yet another way of creating the detail on the grunt. Now, looking at that at 100%, it looks perhaps a little bit um, over the top, but it looks great in a print. You'll, you'll have to trust me on that, I guess. Let me come back to the full size. There we go. Okay, so I'm looking at the photograph and I can remember that as these clouds were passed, you know, the wind would sweep the clouds across the landscape. Every now and then we would see the mountains behind just peep through. So I thought I need to add one of those in. And so what I've done is I've got another photograph let me just turn that off. I'll turn my opacity up. And so there's the photograph. And I'm just looking at these areas here. And I thought if I can just sort of drop them in, I've then put a, uh, let me just turn that off. There we go. There's my mask. Sorry, there we go. Very difficult to be socially pleasant with you kind viewers and operate software at the same time. I struggle with it from time to time, as you can see. So there's the, the mask and I've just dropped that image in. And it's a soft edge mask, as you can see. So by having the soft edge, there's no hard edges to, uh, to uh, scare the, the image, to make it look stuck in. And then I've adjusted the opacity so that it just looks like it's just showing through. Now, I, I had something like 11%, I think it was. Looking at it today, you know, maybe we could even go up to you know, 25 or something like that. So it's something that you can adjust. So 
I, it's just, I didn't want it to be strong. And I actually remember the idea of having it down at 11% was that, you know, you would look at that photograph and see, wow, look at the clouds, look at the mountain. There's a real weather system happening there. And as you look closer, you just get to see that hint of the mountain in the background. And so leaving something for the viewer, for the more dedicated viewer to discover is quite a nice thing to do. So then I'm back along, I, I've then doing a, a curves adjustment where uh, I've just done an, a, an auto curves probably, and I've just put a little bit of color in there. You can do, do that in a number of different ways. I won't go into why. I've then dropped it into Silver FX Pro and it's again just toned it up a little bit for me. And I've also probably used a little bit of its structure. Silver FX does have a nice structure slider. So I've just added that in a little bit more as well. Um, then to finish off, finally, again, just another curve. So you'll see here on the curve, I've just lightened it up a little bit. So now we remember I talked about these areas here. They're going to be very close to paper white, but they will have tone in them. And uh, because of my remedial work that I did way back down here. So that's just, and I think that that last curve just you know, gets the image to sing. And then finally, I'm just worried about this dark area here. I just feel that if I'm looking at the photo, it does grab me a little bit. And so I've just added in another curves adjustment and just lightened that down. And so all of these steps are done so that when I'm looking at the print at the end of the day, when it's a print up on the wall, I have all of these thoughts that, yeah, you know, well, I guess by the time I get to that point, it's got to be right. It's got to be perfect. So my way of working I, in this particular picture, I, uh, you know, these steps didn't all happen automatically. I pinned the print up without the background on my wall and I lived with it now, in my, uh, my studio. I've got a pin board, I put a print up and I think about it. And I just thought, mm, need something more. So that was where the idea for the background came in. And so it's a process of step by step. Yes, I can demonstrate it to you here in five or 10 minutes, nice and quickly, but the actual thinking it through, the idea, and this is where I come back once again, if you don't have an idea, you don't have a photograph. So to summarize, a great print relies on paper like Canson, agreed, but it starts at the time you take the photograph. And every step along the way needs to be done as best as you possibly can so that the print on the wall is the best it possibly can be as well. At the end of the day, I have a file with lots and lots of layers. I will make a new copy of that file. I never throw my, lay my layers away. Obviously, as a magazine editor, I need layers like this to demonstrate, to write articles, etc. Um, so there's a reason that I keep my layered files. But it also means that if I do an exhibition or do the print again for a client, I can make little adjustments if I want to without having to start from scratch. However, to make a print, I will flatten the layer and save it as a new file. I normally save it as a TIFF 16-bit, sometimes a Photoshop format 16-bit. Then my my life is a little bit different in that I have a studio with a printer and I have at home where I'm working from now and that's where I have my ASO monitor, uh, my Wacom Cintiq and all of my paraphernalia because I like working from home. So I will then Dropbox that file and then the next day I'll pick it up. I have another ASO monitor down at the studio, Epson printer, got all of my cans and paper and then I print it out. These days I more or less exclusively print on RAG Photographique. Um, Although having just come back from Antarctica with my late season, I'm thinking that platine with its, uh, with its uh, eggshell sheen, that might be quite a nice surface to experiment with. But I think it's a matter of you know, printing with a number of different papers to start with and working out what you like. I find that when I'm shooting color, when I do black and white, that the way that I process my files just sits nicely on RAG Photographique. And I think that's what it's all about, being happy with the print that you've made at the end of the day. Thanks for watching.